care and education, all of that is going to improve the life of a baby or a toddler or a family. Maybe it means that you notice something that a child needs that you haven't noticed before. Maybe you pause before you react to something that a parent says to think about what that parent might be feeling about having a child with a developmental variation. Maybe you take some time to talk to colleagues and support each other. It all makes a difference. Our knowledge and our understanding makes us so much more effective in our work. For those of you who've been here before, how many people have been here before? All right. <laughs> we, all, we all just get together and here and have this, this baby party. Um, so we have evaluations, as you know, at the end of every year. And every year, people say, please do more on challenging behaviors. And um, so what a pleasure it is to have Laura Martin here. Uh, Laura is a uh, mental health and, I have to say, right, disability specialist. Sorry, I can't choke out that word. <laughs> In Asheville, North Carolina, it is her title, um, at the Berger Center for Early Learning. Um, and what impresses me the most about Laura, as I've come to know her over the past few years in our work together, is her embodiment of the lifelong learner. Laura seizes every opportunity to learn something new that she can apply to her work. And that learning, when Laura does it, is, is not passive. It is a very active learning. Um, you can see in her face and in her body when she gets excited about something new that she's sharing. Um, so she's always bringing things back to us to learn. She is a constructor of knowledge, and she is so passionate about her work and our work. Laura's been presenting at the Institute for several years now, and every year people would stop me and say, I just went to that session that Laura Martin did. Actually, they usually say that woman from the South. <laughs> I know who they're talking about. <laughs> well, not this year, because we emptied out Asheville this year to, to, for new presenters. Um, but uh, so every year people leave and say, you know, I just went to that session. Everybody needs to hear this. And so today, everybody will. Laura Martin. Margie, uh, it's a real honor to be here today. Um, and as I look out into the audience, I have four or five of my closest friends and colleagues that have joined me from Asheville. And, and a lot of other familiar faces, uh, people that have been coming to the Institute for years, and, and it really brings me a sense of calm. Uh, and I also, um, I was laying in bed last night and I was thinking about, you know, how I feel when I'm at Bank Street. And, um, you know, in an effort not to sound too cheesy, I really just want to thank everybody at Bank Street who makes this place feel so welcome. Every time I come here, I get super jazzed about our field, and I want to go back to North Carolina and implement what I've learned and learn more. Uh, so thank you to all of the Bank Street folks. You know? All right, so here is what I'm going to talk about, or what we're going to talk about today, right? Um, in short, uh, as teachers, as caregivers, this is what we think we're after, okay? We're after the regulated child who doesn't engage in challenging behaviors. But how do we get there? Well, it starts off with a regulated teacher who is emotionally uh, responsive and aware of their emotional well-being. And, and when these two interactions are functioning together well, we hope to then create emotionally responsive classroom communities. Um, of course, it, there's much more to this. Um, and for this discussion, I am using the teaching pyramid from Steffel, out of Vanderbilt originally, and now uh, with the pyramid consortium, uh, as a structural framework to talk about some additional ways uh, that we can create a responsive classroom community. And for the folks that were in the session yesterday, we kind of touched a little bit, I see some of y'all, we touched a little bit on this. Um, so I hope to elaborate on that. I want to start off with a story, uh, and, and before I do, I just want to mention that um, some of the stories that you might hear today could bring up feelings, uh, and, and so please uh, take care of yourself. If, uh, if you feel like you need to get up and go to the bathroom, take a deep breath, uh, you know, or stretch, whatever 
it as you need to do because um, sometimes stories about children who engage in challenging behaviors or use challenging behaviors, uh, you know, they just, uh, feelings arise, okay? Uh, I started off almost 15 years ago uh, in early intervention in, in Western North Carolina. I live in Asheville. I'm not sure if any of you all are familiar with Asheville, but Asheville is this cool, progressive, small city uh, in the Western North Carolina. But most of the families that we serve are in the are, are in the county, right? Which is which is very rural, and um, and I can remember, and, and my friends and colleagues, they, they will uh, say this is true for sure. I can remember when we would first get a case. Uh, we have to, you know, we'd have to call a family and introduce ourselves. Um, and uh, this was before we all had GPS on our phone, and we'd have to ask for directions. And so the, the family would be giving us directions, and, and they'd go something like this. Uh, all right, go go on Route 70 for about 10 miles. Okay, 10 miles? Well, well, about 10 miles. And then um, you're going to see Cane Creek Bridge Road. Uh, take a left and go over the bridge. And then you're going to see two pastures. Sometimes they have cows in them. Sometimes they don't. So past the two pastures, and then there's an old tobacco barn. And right beyond that tobacco barn, there's a, a street. So take a right and climb up into the mountains. And as the road forks, do not go left. So if you don't want to go up to that area, go right. Uh, okay, all right. And, and, and then the trailer will be up on the right, and that's our house. Uh, okay, thank you. I, I look forward to meeting you. Um, I get on the phone, and I, I look at the directions, and I say, uh, uh, okay, that's real big. That's real big, but we found the houses, didn't we? Every single time we found the houses. Um, so, um, very rural. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there, there are um, families that you work with over the years that you care deeply about. And then there are some families that you don't know how you feel about them. And some families you just struggle to connect with. And then other families that you never forget, right? Friend, uh, children and families that you never forget. Uh, you know, some of the details you forget, but for the most part, you don't forget. I'm going to tell you a story about a family I still think about today. Um, uh, and a child that I still think about today. Um, his name is Greg. Uh, he was two years old when I was working with him. And he had long hair hung down in his face, and these beautiful green eyes. Um, I was assigned the case because he had significant uh, area development, developmental delays in all areas of his development, and extremely challenging behaviors. Uh, the behaviors he exhibited were impulsivity. I mean, he really took impulsivity to a different level. He would um, run into the kitchen, jump on the counter, jump off the counter, open the refrigerator, throw something on the floor, run through the house, crash on the couch, hug his mom, bite his mom's arm, jump off the coffee table, land on his 10-month-old sister, um, and then come back and fall on the couch. Uh, and so um, he also would engage in self-injurious behavior. He, he uh, had a lot of repetitive head banging. Um, and I can remember the dad telling me when I first met his dad that um, diaper changing and, uh, and, uh, and taking a bath was so hard because he would hit and kick and bite. He had no language. Uh, he used grunts to express himself. And, and when I was thinking about him as I was writing this, I don't even really remember him pointing. So just using grunts to, to try to express himself. Um, he, he really struggled with self-feeding uh, and, and, and self-regulation and had pretty significant sensory issues. So he had an IFSP, an Individualized Family Service Plan, um, and was receiving speech therapy, occupational therapy, and special instruction. And, and I was a special instruction provider. He loved balls. If anything that had a ball, that was his favorite tool. And sometimes even things that weren't a ball became a ball. Uh, I remember there was always a few dogs around, and he was really good with them. And the dogs were really good with him. He was very gentle with the dogs. Uh, and, and mom and dad just, they were struggling without a parent. And not so much because of the delays and, and the, all the domains, but really just because of his challenge of behavior. Uh, it, it was about a 30 minute drive out to his house. Um, and the trailer they lived in uh, was, was, uh, was in very rough condition. The, the, the steps going up to the trailer were broken and there was no railing. Um, there, were, there was one hole that I can remember in the floor of the trailer that you could, you could see the ground. So clearly rodents could get in. Um, there was garbage piled up on the, the porch. They didn't have, you know, they lived in the county. They didn't have city garbage pickups. So it was always like 
kind of had to avoid the garbage to get in the front door. Um, and there was something going on with the windows. Like, I can't, there was no glass, it was just plastic. Um, and so, you know, it was hard to see this. And, and I knew right away that I was going to have to be monitoring for safety. And I remember on my first visit, I sat on the floor and asked mom to tell me a little bit about Greg's medical and developmental history. And, and I was trying to take this all in. You know, I had seen kids who had similar delays. Um, but something was different. This felt different. And mom asked what she should do. And I, and I, I said, uh, I can remember saying this. I was like, I, I, I don't really know. Um, I, uh, I'm going to have to think about it and let you know. You know? <laughs> so uh, every visit after, I can remember pulling up to the trailer. You know, sitting in front of the trailer and trying to get ready to go in, and I can re remember like feeling my heart start to race because um, I didn't really know what I was going to see when I went in, and I, and I always wore the same old black pants because uh, I didn't really know what I was going to sit in, uh, and and you know, at home visitors, you know, you know, um, and so Greg, Greg always seemed excited to see me. Uh, he would he he would get he would get excited, maybe, maybe a little overstimulated. And um, he would jump from the couch to the chair, run to the back bedrooms, and crash into the couch again, uh, make loud noises. Um, and then so we, you know, I tried to get him to sit down and play, and we would start playing. And then the next thing you know, he'd run and do this again, and um, pull whatever out of the refrigerator and eat it, and knock his sister over, and hug his mom, and sometimes try to fight her. Uh, and this continued. I mean, this was uh, the first kid that ever bit me so hard I, I had to have an incident. You know, fill out an incident report and um, and uh, talk to a nurse. Um, I mean, can you feel this as I, as I talk about this? <laughs> yeah. So that was his home. That was his life, and I had the job of, of going in, visiting, and trying to help him. And I was young, and I was energetic, uh, and I was I was like, I can do this. I can help it, you know. Um, and so you know, I, they needed some routines in the house, and he had to set some limits and. Maybe I can even help link mom to some mental health services. Um, I will definitely need to consult with the occupational therapist and the speech therapist. But as a team, we got this. In those days, we were really fortunate back in early intervention. This is when we were all housed together, right? All the different disciplines were housed in the same building. And so you could go out on your own visit, and you could come back, and you could consult with the speech therapist, and you could consult with the psychologist. And so that's what I did. I'd go back, and I'd, I'd go to the OT, and I'd say, all right, this is what happened. Greg, and she was on the case, um, and she uh, said, all right, Laura, this is what you gotta do. When you go in, you gotta match his energy, okay? And then you gotta slowly try to bring him down. Uh, okay, I can, I can do that. So I go in, and I, I, you know, I try to match his energy, and I, I do it loud, and, and, and I, I be running around the trailer, and I jump in, and, and I was like, and then I try to like, you know, kind of bring my energy down, and bring my tone down, and I was like, nah, that didn't really work. <laughs> so I go back, I go back to, uh, I go back to the office, I'll be like, no, no. Um, and I said, I know what we need. We, we all need to go together, right? All, all the, uh, the speech, the therapist, myself, we all need to go together. So we did that. Greg, Greg was like, oh, what is happening with all you people in the house? He really did. It, it really appeared as if that was overstimulating. So that didn't work. And, and really, as I tell you this story, I, uh, it's kind of embarrassing to think that I, I was like running around that trailer, yelling and screaming, trying to match his energy. Now that is absolutely um, a, a strategy, you know. That's called regulation games, but that's not the way to do it. Okay? <laughs> so, um, you know, so so mom was always asking, you know, what should I do when he bites me? And his dad say, when he kicks me when I'm diaper changing. You know, what happens when he when he when he's pushing his baby sister who's only 10 or 11 months old over? What should we do? And I'd give her answers. And I'd give her suggestions and, and I'd, you know, try the best I could to find out all the best information about how to respond to challenging behaviors. And, uh, and then I'd go back the next week and I would say, uh, that didn't work. Uh, well, I'd give a few more suggestions. And, uh, you know, I felt like I was pretty good at building relationships and not really seeming too judgmental. And so I, I think mom trusted me. Um, and I think that she really tried to implement these strategies. Um, but this pattern continued. I go into the home. I, I, I give some suggestions. I model the suggestions. They didn't work. The family situation got worse, and safety was compromised. So the Department of Social Services was called. I, I think you all in the city call it uh, ACS, right? And so I, uh, 
I was subpoenaed and I had to testify. And they took the children, the baby and, and Greg, into foster care that day. Um, I continued working with the family during supervised visitations, trying to work on the ISSP's goals. It was uncomfortable. And, and mom said to me, I, I was really mad at you, Laura, for what you did. And I'm sure she was, but she, she let me continue working with them, and so that was good. Um, you know, Greg bounced around from foster home to foster home, um, but because of his extreme challenging behaviors, he ended he would kind of what we call blow out of a foster home, for lack of better words. Um, and he ended up in a therapeutic foster home where the caregivers had specialized training. And, you know, it's one of the most memorable experiences for me because of how complicated the situation was and how complicated the child was. The living conditions were scary, um, and it was so stressful having to go to court and testify. But when this child aged out, you know, he was in the infantile program, he turned three, when he aged out, I, I wasn't really sure if I had helped him enough, if I had helped him enough, if I had helped his family enough. You know, knowing what I know now about challenging behaviors, I wish I had done some things a lot of things differently. Uh, I wonder if I had done a better job of, of being present and trying to connect with mom um, and, and really not going in there like a Mrs. Fix-It if, uh, if things would have been different and, and what might have happened. You know, I, I went in knowing a lot and I wish I had, I had gone in wondering more. What would have happened if I had wondered with her? What do you think he's, what, why do you think he's doing this? What do you think he needs? What do you think might help Greg? If I had asked more aggressive questions, would we have found out that he had fetal alcohol syndrome? So, challenging behavior means many things to many people and happens in all different areas. I just told you a story about my experience in a rural area, but this is not about a child in a rural area. This could be a kid in New York City. It could be in a kid, a kid, a child in your class right now. There is an alarming number of very young children being expelled from early care and education programs for challenging behavior across the, across the country. I'm sure we're all familiar with this, right? It's the number one professional development request in early childhood, which is cool for me. It's job security, but absolutely, um, you know, it absolutely speaks to the need for more education and training when it comes to responding to challenging behavior. So, so what does challenging behavior mean to you? What does it look like? What does it feel like? These are some quotes that I've heard, direct quotes, that I've been kind of jotting down over the years, that I've heard, oh, somebody should be real loud. So these are quotes that I hear from teachers um, on a regular basis. Do, do any of these quotes resonate with you? Have you ever thought them? Yeah, yeah. Just a hot mess. It's contagious, right? When there's one child who's engaging in challenging behaviors, then it seems like it's kind of like a ripple effect and there's other challenging behaviors in the classroom, right? Um, oh man, it's been a day. Uh, this isn't fair to the other children. Yeah. Is there any other new ones that I need to add up for the next time I do it? <laughs> um, so, behavior is a, um, is a powerful communication tool, right? It sends a message really quickly. When a child is avoiding cleanup and they spit in your face, you know real quickly that they weren't done playing and didn't want to clean up. It becomes real clear, real fast. And children use behavior because it works, but it can really disrupt the classroom, especially if the teacher becomes upset and reactive. We can't control the behavior. We can't control the behavior. All we can control is how we set things up and how we respond, right? A regulated teacher can equal a regulated child, which can equal a regulated classroom. So I want to invite you uh, to try something with me. I want you to think about a time when a child pushed you to your limits, a real specific time that you felt like you were truly at your wit's end. It's not a time you're proud of. You might, you might have felt annoyed or angry or agitated. It might even feel uncomfortable right now to think about it. And as you think about this, <coughs> notice how you feel on the inside right now as you think about it. Okay, so this is exactly how I want you to do it, right? So I want you to think about it. And then if you're comfortable or not, turn. And I don't say 
like sarcastically. Uh, I truly mean that if, you, if you're not comfortable turning and sharing, please, please don't hesitate to just continue thinking about it. Turn and share with someone close to you um, about this time where you were truly pushed to your limit. Take about three minutes and share. The listener's job is to actively listen, and then at the end, you can ask one clarifying question, and then switch. Are those directions clear? Okay. All right, so three minutes, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to notice what's happening on the inside as we share this experience of being pushed to our limit. All right, so turn and share or, or think about it, and then we'll, we'll get back together. <laughs>
So what is your heart rate like now? Where are your shoulders? In 
summary, noticing and tracking the sensations on the inside of your body when you think about your resource helps calm and reset your nervous system after a stressful experience. So hopefully you feel a little bit better now than you did just a few minutes ago when you shared being pushed to your limit. If you're in a better place, feeling calm and good in your body, then you are more likely to have an intentional response to whatever comes at you. And you will be open to learning new ways. Now I'm going to tell you another story that illustrates this. I was in a two-year-old classroom uh, not too long ago. And I was watching this child named Corbin. That's Corbin. Corbin is a super bright and active child. And, and I'm watching him, and he's having a really rough morning. So I decided to join him in the block. He was building fences for animals, and another child joined us. And I, I was facilitating the play, and things were really going well. And then a third child came into the block area to join us. And he grabbed the block, and he was just, you know, he was going to try to help us build some more fences. Um, and within seconds, Corbin picked up a block and threw it at this child's face. He jumped up, he climbed over the shelf, and as he ran by dramatic play, he yanked a purse off a child's arm, and that child like, fell down and started crying. And then Corbin ran over to the book area and just started throwing books into the air. So, uh, you know, I got up um, and, and followed Corbin over to the book area. And, and as, as I'm following him over there, as he, get, as he gets over there, I'm like, oh, no, that is not okay. But I didn't say, oh, no, that's not okay. I was like, oh, no, that is not okay. And that's when I noticed from that time I had followed him into the book area that my heart rate was slightly elevated, my shoulders were tense. I mean, we've all been here, right? We've just had this experience. We've all been here. <coughs> this happens when you work with young children. But what happens? next determines everything. If I had stayed in that elevated state, any interactions that came next would not have been fruitful. I wouldn't, it wouldn't have been good for Corbin, it wouldn't have been good for me, and it wouldn't have been good for the relationship. So this is where the self-regulation skills come in. So I, I did something that, that helps me. Uh, I, I knelt down, because he's in the book area, and so I wanted to be on his level, so we'll pretend Corbin's right here. So I knelt down, not giving him eye contact, and here I am down on my knees. And it looked like he was calm. And so I looked at him, and I was like, you're calm. And, and before I even finished, he took two books and went, doo -doo -doo. and one hit me in the arm, and one hit me in the chest. And the one in the chest hurt. And so I, I, I paused, um, and, and I started grounding. And, and literally just pushing my knees, the tops of my shins and the tops of my feet, into the ground and noticing what was happening. This is just happening with, with, within seconds, right? They say it takes 20 seconds to restabilize your nervous system after stress when you're doing these techniques. And so I calmed down. I felt my heart rate slowing down. And a, and a funny thing happened. So did Corbin. And so I started slowly kind of moving closer to him. And I picked up one of the books and still kind of sideways to him, not giving him eye contact. And, and I start looking at the book, you know, and uh, I'm like, wow, calm down. It seemed like you were mad. Let's go pick up those blocks and check on your friend. And then we can talk about it. He's about, he's almost three and he's extremely good. I was able to be responsive versus reactive. I validated his feelings and then we, in a very age appropriate way, problem solved. He really seemed to like this. And so, oops, so looking back at this, with just a little self-reflection, I remembered how my morning started off. I didn't start my morning in Corbin's classroom. I had started off at another center with my EI client, with my early interview client. And it's a terrible center. Some of my friends will know about this. I, I, a terrible center. I mean, the teachers are mean. I, I really, I, I have no other way of saying this. They, they were mean. The way they talk to the children is awful. The, 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 the toys, they barely have any toys, and <coughs> excuse me, the toys they do have are broken, and pieces of the puzzles are missing. Um, and so when I left that center, I, I felt awful for, for my clients, but for all the children in that, in that classroom. Uh, I, I didn't even realize how elevated I was coming in Corbin's room after that experience. We've all had these experiences. 
right? We come in with baggage, whether it's from a rough morning, family issues, financial stress, whatever it is. But we gotta leave that bag at the door to connect and be present with our children. I was able to turn that interaction with Corbin into an opportunity to problem solve, which supported our relationship. The responsibilities a teacher has when working with a child who uses or is struggling with challenging behaviors is enormous. You teach that child who is struggling that the challenging behavior is not acceptable. You teach this acceptable behavior, right? You keep all the children safe, the other children. You help the peers develop relationships with a child who's using challenging behavior, and then you help all the children feel like they belong. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a whole lot of responsibility when it comes to working with children with challenging behavior. If we pull off these responsibilities, there are huge consequences. Less bullying, less violence, which could you know, eventually equal less incarceration, right? Teachers in early care and education sometimes spend up to 50 hours a week with a child. The children, right? We, we allow our children in our program allow lots of better work. But some of our kids are with us 10 hours a day. We have 10 hours. Um, and so, you know, that's a significant <coughs> amount of time to make a difference. And it's a real opportunity to be some of the first responders when it comes to helping child that's struggling with child behavior. I mean, it's an incredibly important job. So, so what have we been doing here, right? We just recognized when we got activated we learn two skills, okay? I, I, they're called resourcing, which is more than thinking about your happy place, right? It's thinking about something that makes you feel better, but then noticing what's happening on the inside when you think about that and really trying to pay attention to the sensation. Generally just thinking about how to become, you know, present and connected and responsive. So what we're doing here is we're creating communities that nurture children, that foster their development, and help them truly connect with people in meaningful ways. So admittedly, this becomes very complicated in practice. But the process is rooted in a fairly simple concept. We all know this, right? Children develop in the context of their relationships. First with their immediate caregivers, their parents, and their families, and then extending outward to other adults and, and peers. And it's the quality of those relationships that sets the foundation for a child's development. You know, put simply, good relationships foster positive development. This is where we come in. As adult caregivers, we must commit to developing quality relationships with children and families we serve. Now think about the relationships in your life, right? When you are stressed, busy, distracted, dysregulated, it is hard for you to form relationships and maintain them. But when we approach others feeling confident and with a real awareness of our own emotional responses, we are able to be grounded and intentional in how we build relationships. We must remember that the emotional well-being of a young child is tied directly to what we, their caregivers, bring to the relationship. Well, on my uh, on my flight up here, I uh, you know I, I, I was prepared, but uh, I, you know I was doing a little last-minute work on the keynotes and looking at my calendar and thinking about what cool stuff I'm gonna do in New York City and you know, basically not listening to uh, the um, flight attendant as they you know, talked about the rules. Um, <laughs> but this one line sort of jumped out at me. If you are traveling with young children, remember to put your own oxygen mask on first before assisting others. To help the children in our care navigate their own world, to learn, to regulate their own emotions, to find appropriate ways to communicate what they need, we must first address our own emotional well-being. This relationship-based concept is not new to all of us, I'm sure. But what does it really take to fuel, uh, to fuel these connections and build authentic relationships? I, I've been thinking about this for a long time, a very long time. And, um, and I noticed that it doesn't come natural or easy to some people, right, to build relationships. And I go back to this experience I had a few years ago. Uh, I was working with two teachers, one right out of school, uh, and one who had been with Head Start for about 15 years. They had beautiful interactions with children, and they really worked hard to create rich experiences. But they were struggling to get their head around how to support children with challenging behavior. So I decided to take them to a demonstration classroom, right, uh, to observe a teacher who really knew what she was doing. And, and, and she really knew how to implement the teaching pyramid, which 
which is, for those of you who are, are not familiar with it, it's a framework of evidence-based practices for preventing and managing challenging behavior. And you'll see an image of that, and, and we can talk more about how you can get more information about that afterwards if, you're, if you want to. So, so this teacher was using this framework. She used the entire list of effective strategies for, for building positive relationships. I mean, on paper, she was doing everything right. But in reality, it did not feel like a nurturing and responsive community. She was using like these really structured responses and therefore lost the responsiveness. So what we took away from that, and I, and I think there's somebody in this audience that will agree with me, what we took away from that was, you know, the strategies are important, but really what is important is the authentic, caring relationship teachers have with their children. I guess maybe I should say, it's not strategies or relationship, it's both. But it really was this eye-opening experience about what an authentic relationship looks like. Um, this felt very much like something I had just read in Powerful Interactions as I was getting ready to come up here. I knew that um, Amy was gonna be here. For those of you who were here last night and heard the Powerful Interactions folks talk, um, you know, there was a quote in there that said something like, we talk about building relationships with kids as if it's a task to be checked off our do list. And then once we do that, like we, we're done, we built the relationship, now we can be free to do the real teaching. <laughs> so while there are frameworks out there, and the teaching pyramid is my favorite, I encourage us all to think more deeply about how we connect with children. The opposite of this is when I see a teacher coming from a place of empathy and curiosity. It's really only from this place that we will truly be able to understand that concerning behavior is an unmet social or emotional need. It's the child telling us, I'm just trying to get my needs met. A colleague and I were talking the other day, and she, she's no longer in the classroom, um, but she said, hey, Mar, do, do you remember Anthony? I'm like, yeah, are you sure? Yeah. She's like, you know, Anthony and the two other brothers, they were all an early head start. He was the little boy that every day, about two and a half, a little boy every day, and he, and he was potty trained. A little boy every day for weeks and weeks would uh, get mad, pull his pants down, look at Katie, the teacher, and pee on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> she was getting so frustrated and sick of cleaning up, right? There's all these procedures for cleaning up bodily fluids in our state. And so she really was getting sick and she was annoyed. And she said, I, I came in and she said, huh. I wonder, I, I said, I'm sorry, I came in. She, she said that I came in. Excuse me. And I said, uh, huh, I, I wonder why he's doing that. This was a couple years ago. I wonder why he's doing that. Think about that phrase. Simple, short, but powerful. He immediately had to shift and said, I, I never really thought about why he was doing that. And so in that moment, she was able to, she was able to start looking at that behavior differently and was truly more empathetic. She really began wondering, I, I wonder what is going on. Why is he doing that? What is he on the floor doing for him? From there, that place of empathy and curiosity, we started working together to address the peeing on the floor. And it turns out he was scared of the sound of, the, of walking on the tile into the bathroom, which this is not uncommon, actually. So children do get, have a lot of fear sometimes around bathrooms in bathrooms. And so what we did is we laid a yoga mat down on, in the bathroom so that he could walk on that when he wanted to go to the bathroom. So Katie's interactions with Anthony helped reinforce his view of the world and, uh, and, know that, and now that she's coming from this better place, this place of empathy and curiosity, maybe Anthony's worldview is just a little more positive. You know, another real value in building relationships, not only with the child and the child's family, but all the helpers in that child's life uh, is a certain level of trust is developed with everyone. And, and important information is shared. You know, the mom begins to open up about her stress during pregnancy and her postpartum depression and how she struggled bonding with her baby. The teacher begins to talk about how this child is using challenging behaviors, really pushes her buttons because it reminds her of her brother because she has a difficult relationship, emotional teaching practices and supportive classroom environments to meet the needs of the specific children in our care. I mean, it's absolutely important to respond to behavior. I mean, don't think I'm, I'm saying that, right? But, but it's rarely the response that makes it better. It's the 
connection. I mean, really, the connection makes the response meaningful and, and it makes it work. You know, it's like when someone you don't like asks you to do something, you're like, no. Nah. <laughs> but when someone you love asks you to do the same thing, you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> As we make these connections, we can start creating strategies that will not only foster individual children's social emotional competence, but will start to create a space where children feel like they belong, that they're part of the community, and that they genuinely feel safe and secure. So what are a few of the social teaching practices, the emotional teaching practices we use to create responsive care? <coughs> I have some of them up here if you want to holler them out. But is it, I mean, so what, what are some of the things that you do in your classroom to create, to, to, to social emotional teaching practices you use in your classroom? Right, we use a primary care model. We have family photos. We allow transitional objects. Not only do we allow them, we encourage them. We, with you know, transitional objects. Like, I love the, uh, you know, their their favorite stuffed animal, their blanket, whatever it is. Um, we teach emotional literacy by using children's literature. We make books for children who might be experiencing big feelings. There's an example of one of these homemade books down here on the bottom. This was a, little, a, a, a child, a young child, who, uh, whose mother had to uh, have a mastectomy. And so this book is, she has to have an operation to fix her boobs. It's a handmade book um, with very, very simple script. Or if there, you know, another example of a handmade book would be if, if the family had experienced a natural disaster make a book around that, or the grandmother moving out of the country. We begin, we, we also, another strategy is we also begin to practice engaging these very young children in the problem solving process. And as we are embedding these practices into our daily routines, we always want to hold the development of the children in our care in our minds, their temperaments, and how all of that influences how we set up supportive environments. And in order to have a responsive classroom, the teacher has to have a strong understanding of development, especially emotional development. I remember a story, a few, or, or an experience a few years back um, where uh, an infant teacher, this was an infant classroom, uh, an infant room teacher was so worried about this baby. And so they, she asked me to come in and observe and uh, she was worried about this baby, baby's challenging behavior. And um, I said, okay, tell, tell me what's going on. She says, oh, he's, he's just, he just keeps pulling hair. I said, oh, okay. Um, and she said, yeah, he's, he's pulling hair and it's really violent. <laughs> this, is, this is true. You were one of my friends at the fair. She, she even said the baby was being violent. <laughs> Clearly, she didn't have an understanding of development. I mean, that's cause and effect, right? Pull your hair, you make a loud noise, ooh, that is fun. You know? <laughs> Or maybe um, I just learned how to reach and grab, and that looks like a mobile. <coughs> maybe if you put your hair up, they wouldn't, he wouldn't pull it. Right? So I wonder whose problem this was. And, and why I make light of it. it it's, it's true. So having a, a true understanding of, of, of development um, will, will, help us, uh, will help us know, really, whose problem is it? And is it really a challenging behavior? Um, and, and I don't think you can talk about development without talking about temperament. And this came up in the workshop yesterday when we were talking about self-regulation. But I think, and we didn't talk about this yesterday, Margie, because we just did it on the fly, but I think um, before we talk about temperament of the child, we need, maybe we did talk about this, yeah. we need to consider our own temperament. Right? Um, I, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about uh, the term goodness of fit, so I just want to mention that. You know, it's, I often notice that behaviors, behaviors occur when there's not a goodness of fit. Something about the teacher's temperament and the child's temperament is a mismatch, if you will, right? A, a not a goodness of fit. Um, and, I, and I gave this example yesterday, right? You, you have a, a kid who just wants to be held all the time, wants to be warm, if they're, if they're a baby, um, because maybe they're the shy and cautious temperament, right? They just want to be 
own that teacher, their primary care giver. And then you have a teacher who likes a lot of space. Right? And I say, maybe they're the irritable type. Temper. But again, this, this, this could cause, this, this is really kind of a recipe for disaster, right? It can really um, be problematic. And then the teacher is starting to think, oh my God, this child has really challenging behaviors. When in actuality, it's, it's not a good business fix. Um, you know, so knowing the kid's temperament, know, understanding your own temperament, um, <coughs> can determine or influence how we respond when encountering stress, right? Which is usually why children have challenging behaviors. Which we know can present like challenging behaviors. So, you know, just having an understanding of temperament and knowing that it plays into it can really help us remain calm and be responsive. You know, development, child development and, and temperament could be its own top, you know, talk. I, I mean, you probably have a whole graduate class on it, you know? So, um, you know, I just wanted to mention. All right, now let's start to think about supportive environments. How do we create, and when I say environments, I, I literally mean our classroom environment um, for our purposes today. Uh, you know, how do we create a space that helps children feel safe and secure when they're away from their primary grown-ups? How can we help them stay connected to their people? Like I mentioned earlier, we encourage transitional options. And I, and, I, and I say this because, um, and I emphasize it because I can remember when I first started at Vernon, where I worked, the Early Head Start program in Asheville, in the family handbook, and, and this is embarrassing to say, in the family handbook, there was a rule about not allowing um, our babies to bring things from home into the classroom. And I didn't know that much that I started I mean, I guess I'm a little bit, but I started 12 years ago with that program. And I, I remember reading that and being like, oh, that doesn't feel right. Um, and so it took me a couple years to, to influence the power of the bees to change that. But so that's why I'm really stressing it to you all. So we encourage transitional objects, you know? Um, let's see, what else do we do? We have routines, right? And I, and I, and I just want to highlight that. Most of us know that, but it's extremely important in order to create this responsive environment to have routines and predictability in their daily schedule. We post feeling faces and feeling charts in appropriate places. We make inviting soft and safe faces. That's what we call them. Like, I don't know, maybe you call them, um, what, a cozy corner or, you know, a, a really a space where a child can go um, and, and, and ex, you know, just have, have space away from other children or be able to express their big feelings. But it's just a safe, comforting, inviting space. We allow a child who uh, needs a, a special chair or a bean bag um, to sit in. We allow those things at, at circle time or at any time, really. Uh, we have clearly defined play spaces that are, that are organized and labeled. Um, and plenty of free play opportunities. And inviting space to paint, to express yourself, and sensory play, sensory tables. Because what we know about uh, sensory experiences is that they're very calming to the nervous system. When you have a calm nervous system, you're less likely to engage in challenging behaviors. Books that are relevant to the children's lives, and dramatic play that is relevant to where they are emotionally. Right, so in, a, in our toddler rooms, we're going to have phones so they can call home. We're going to have baby dolls with uh, doctor kits so they can, you know, they can experience those big feelings in a safe way with toys. Um, you know, and, and sometimes things come up for children, uh, and then we tweak the environment and we tweak the curriculum to meet those needs. Like for example, when you're two year old in your classroom's, you know, mother is pregnant and they're going to be a, a big sister, we will then tweak the environment and make sure we have uh, materials available for them to play out those big things. Anything else you think that, that I've missed that helps? I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of things I missed, but um, you know, this is, this is uh, some real specific examples of how we create uh, a supportive environment. Another thing that should be talked about is how we create an effective workforce. And, and you know, I, I debated whether or not to put this in because like it's not the fun part of, of thinking about how to 
support uh, teachers and families and children with challenging behaviors. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, oh, I am this. As an administrator in an Early Head Start program, I am part of, or not, that creates an effective workforce. And so I decided to put it in there. And it's actually the foundation of the teaching pyramid, that, that the framework that I've been referring to. Um, it, it actually comes underneath relationships. Uh, so, so what does it mean um, to be a, uh, to have a, an effective workforce? How does your school or your agency create a responsive culture when it comes to challenging behaviors? Do you get professional development opportunities? What's the buy-in at the admin level, at the administration level, with the teachers and with the families? Is time provided to teachers for team meetings, planning, and communication with families? I mean, it can be tricky to have, you know, when, when, when you're struggling with a child who has challenging behaviors, it can be really tricky to have conversations with families, right? And it's even trickier if you have to do them at drop off and pick up. So is there, is there time allowed to have these kind of sometimes sensitive conversations outside of drop off and pick up? Um, do, do you receive regular supervision? And, and I can't stress that enough. You know, we don't want, we don't want teachers, we don't want to internalize all the hard times, the intense emotions that come up when you're working with all of children, and, and, and really especially children who are engaging in challenging behaviors. See, we need an outlet, right? And, and, and good supervision can be that outlet. Do the families know that you, your program is invested in social emotional development, in fostering the social emotional development of children? And then how are you sharing that information? Are you sending newsletters home? Do you have open house? How do you, how do you let them know that you are truly invested in supporting their child's social emotional development? I know a lot of us who are Head Start people, we do home visits, which is a, is a lovely way to bridge the gap between home and school and also share that, you know, we're interested in your child's social emotional development and this is how we do it. How, how do you do it? How would you like us to do it? And then, you know, do teachers and families get a say in, in what framework or what model we're going to use to prevent and ma manage behaviors? You know, in the trauma world, um, okay. whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. in the trauma world, um, there has been a big shift. And many schools and agencies across the U.S. are creating trauma-informed systems. Is this a, a familiar term for most of you? I mean, it, it, so in the trauma world, they're, we're really moving away from this, this, this mentality of what's wrong with you to what happened to you. And, it, and it's that little shift that has really turned the trauma-informed world around in such a lovely way. So instead of what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. And so I wonder if we need our, our approach to challenging behaviors, to, to kind of look more like this evolution of this of, of the trauma-informed system. Like, you know, it doesn't say challenging behavior-informed systems. I, I couldn't come up with a, a cool phrase for it. But the point is, is that, you know, we no longer want to say, like, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example. We no longer want to say, like, oh, it's so annoying that he's using that behavior. Instead, we, we want to say, I wonder why he's using <laughs> okay. So this is a little girl who uh, she actually just, you know, is running away and climbing the fence and, and trying to escape the playground. We've, we've all seen this. She's two and a half. She is tall, but she is two and a half. Um, so there's little Australia. So watch this, right? We see this behavior every day. Think about how you see it. Is this what you bring to the observation? <laughs> or is this what you bring to the observation?
If we can change the music in our head, we change how we perceive children. Like the trauma-informed system that has been implemented with great success, you can be cre begin, begin creating a behavior-informed system. So research tells us that if we put in place all these practices, right, we, we learn how to regulate ourselves as caregivers, we develop nurturing and responsive relationships, we create high-quality supportive environments, we implement social and emotional teaching practices, and we have an effective workforce, right? If we do all those things, all those foundation pieces of the pyramid, then we will have only a very, very small percentage of children that still use challenging behavior. And for those children, I mean, and really, it is really a true small percentage. For those children, we will need to consider a higher level of intensive intervention. But it's truly a very small percentage. I really can't stress that enough. And this is when we turn to positive behavior support. And again, this is all housed in the teaching pyramid framework. And, and, and PBS, as, it, as most of the people that use this language, PBS, right? Positive behavior support. PBS really looks at the meaning behind the behavior and helps not only to the child, but the adults discover better ways to help. You know, really it helps better ways. PBS helps children communicate in better ways than behavior, right? Because behavior is communication. <clears throat> there are many steps to implementing PBS. I mean, the process is, is intense for those of you who have used it, you know? Um, observation, data gathering, responding immediately to the behavior, the unsafe behavior, <clears throat> creating a team, because it really does take a team when you have children that are up here at this level of persistent challenging behaviors. And then, all the, the, this plan needs to be implemented in all areas, the home, the school, the grocery store. Um, and then you need some way to figure out if it's working, right? Some kind of way to measure. Uh, and, and, and this can be very, very hard for caregivers to manage. But it is extremely effective and a really cool way to learn about the function of behavior. And so just briefly, I think it's important to mention that um, when we can understand the function of behavior, we can then tailor strategies and teach replacement skills, if we understand what the function is, right? Um, because remember, peeing on the floor works, right? We have to find a replacement skill. We have to teach them something else. And, and working with children with challenge behaviors is all consuming. It's exhausting. And by the end of the day, uh, the, you know, the last, you just want to be all done. But I, I encourage you to push through that exhaustion and really reflect on what the function of the behavior is. What is that behavior doing for that child? Okay? So, um, function, behavior falls into two main categories. Again, functional behavior could be its own workshop, could be its own class. But for our purposes today, um, the function of behavior falls into two main categories, right? Obtain an outcome and avoid an outcome. And those are just some of the things that you would you know, think about when you're obtaining an outcome or avoiding an outcome. All right, now watch this two-minute video that's coming on, and let's then let's kind of reflect on what we think the function is. Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm just trying to tell you something. I'm just trying to get my needs met. All right, here we go. Oh, she took his truck. Boy, okay. Oh, that was Ariel's bike. Oh, oh. Oh, she bit the teacher.
then the teacher says, it didn't work. We got it wrong. Because what we don't know, unless we gather more information, do more observations, and possibly obtain a formal social emotional assessment, is that this child has pretty severe anxiety and was recently diagnosed with a general anxiety disorder. Her mom has a history of incarceration and is struggling with a substance use disorder. And it's not uncommon for anxiety to present as very disruptive behavior. So I urge you not to be too quick to jump to a hypothesis. Because when that happens, and I've been guilty of it, I mean, a hypothesis is good. But when we jump to it too quickly, we are less likely to keep asking those important questions that might take us deeper. If we continue to be curious, we are less likely to be judgmental and possibly jump into an inaccurate conclusion. Who knows what might be going on, right? Is there domestic violence in their home? Was there a recent loss? Are there no routines in the home? Does this family come, you know, parent with punishment? Who knows? So in closing, I want to come back to the crucial importance of the job that we do. Oh, actually, let me tell you this real fast. So this is the teaching pyramid, okay? And again, I encourage you, if you want to know more about it, you can look it up. I'm sorry? The Center for Social Emotional Foundations of Early Learning, now housed with the Pyramid Consortium. So in closing, I want to come back to the crucial importance of the job that we do, teaching very young children how to be part of communities and how to interact with the world around them. If you look at it that way, it's obvious that early childhood education is a key component to creating positive, lasting social change. So as an example, you might have heard, I'm from North Carolina, right? And so you might have heard that we have a new piece of legislation this spring that's gotten a lot of national and international attention as the bathroom bill. And really, it's more than a bathroom bill because it strips local communities, cities, and counties of the ability to pass any kind of protection for LGBTQ individuals. And it cancels out the existing protections that already existed. So we at Burner, we're looking at this bill. And we saw a real relevance for the work that we did. We teach children every day to be kind and respectful to people who might be different from them. And it's not just because we want them to be kind and respectful in our classrooms. It's because we see our ultimate role as helping to create a more kind and respectful society. And we believe that teaching those skills from the earliest years of a child's life will allow them to grow up to be an adult who can live those values every day unlike the current state legislator of North Carolina, and unlike the terrible tragedy in Florida. And obviously, the social problems that you all face here in New York are different. But I, I think the principle of it is the same. When we as educators respond in supportive, meaningful ways to children who use challenging behaviors, there's a parallel there to the way that we as society respond to individuals might present challenges. So next time you have a child in your room with challenging behaviors and you feel yourself fr getting frustrated, how are you going to manage your emotional responses? So instead of being annoyed, you will be curious. Instead of hearing the Jaws theme song, you'll hear Bob Marley's Three Little Birds. Thank you.